Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to be looking at how people from all around the world can be more involved in dealing with many of the crisis issues that are being confronted by the United Nations and other groups. My guest today is an expert on this topic. Dr. Bob Flax is a psychologist, organization development consultant, educator, and activist. Dr. Flax is the former executive director of Citizens for Global Solutions and advisor to the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. And he is on the faculty of the Transformative Social Change Program at Saybrook University. Dr. Bob Flax, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Yes, thank you, Bill. It's good to be with you. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's start off just with a very basic question. What is the, well, what is the World Federalist Movement, WFM? We'll start off with that, the World Federalist Movement, the Institute for Global Policy. Sure, sure. Well, that, that's a, it's a rather long name, so we just call it WFM for short. So, um, so yeah, so WFM was founded in 1947, shortly after World War II, out of the conviction that it will take a world federation, and I'll explain that more as, as, as we go on, so that it would take a world federation to achieve world peace. So over the years, it's, it's expanded its focus to include UN reform, uh, human rights, and the environment by building global institutions and strengthening the rule of law. It's best known for convening the coalition that created the International Criminal Court. And WFM serves as an umbrella organization for about 30 organizations worldwide that collectively are known as the World Federalist Movement. Very good. Now, our viewers, if they have more questions about this, they can go to www.wfm-igp.org to get a lot more information. Now, there's another group you've been involved with that uh, we may as well get that out before I get too far into the weeds. Sure is the Global Solutions. What exactly is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, as, as I mentioned, the uh, WFM is an international NGO, offices in the US and, and in the Netherlands, and that's an umbrella organization over about 30 organizations worldwide. So mm -hmm. Citizens for Global Solutions is the main world federalist organization in the United States. So it's a national organization, um, and WFM is the global umbrella organization that helps coordinate it with the other organizations around the world. So we move together on certain issues. I see. So, and our viewers can go to that website at www.globalorganizations.org. Global Solutions. Global Solutions. Org. I'm global sorry, Solutions. Global Solutions. Org. Yes. Org. Yes. Thank L you. So lots much. of letters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alphabet soup. Right. Right. Very right. True. Yeah. And how did this concept come around uh, to be for the for the World Federalist Movement? Where what really prompted it? Sure, sure. Well, the, the idea of the basic unity of humanity is not new. You know, it's found mm -hmm. in all the world's great religions. It's been echoed by many philosophers throughout history. Um, Socrates famously said, "I'm not an Athenian or a Greek, but I'm a citizen of the world." Uh, Dante, who's best known for writing the Divine Comedy, and Dante's Inferno is tucked in there, uh, wrote another book, not as well known, called The Monarch, uh, where he talked about if you have kind of different governments with different rulers, that it's prone, you're prone to having war. But if there was a way to unify them under a single system, you would essentially eliminate war. And moving ahead in history, the, the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, in his book, Perpetual Peace, talked about the structures of a global organization that would be necessary to preserve peace. So the ideas um, uh, uh, you know, of, of global unity have been around forever. Um, but the plan to turn that idea into a political reality really began to pick up steam after World War II. Okay? At that time, with the advent of atomic weapons, um, people realized that you can't have a World War III. I mean, if that happened, that would be the end of humanity. Okay? So shortly after World War II in 1947, delegates from around the United States met in Asheville, North Carolina, 
and formed what at the time was called the United World Federalists. So that organization changed its name a few times and that evolved into Citizens for Global Solutions, the organization I was just the, recently the executive director of. Then a few months later, still in 1947, delegates from my organization and others around the world met in Montreux, Switzerland to form what was then called the World Movement for World Government, which is now known as WFM, the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. So just after World War II, that idea of world unity went from just an idea that would pop up occasionally into an actual movement to try to build what's technically known as a world federation. Now, this federation that we're talking about, how would this be structured? Uh, when we think of any type of international entity, the international entity is the United Nations. And of course, yes. the UN has six organs. It has mm -hmm. the Secretari Secretariat, the Security Council, the General Assembly, the International Court of Justice, the Trusteeship Council, and oh, ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council. Yes. And then you've got all of these UN agencies that are humanitarian agencies working, like uh, UNICEF works with Rotary to eliminate polio. You have uh, agencies that are helping move aircraft, ships, mail, weather information, and international mm -hmm. airspace, which is a huge operation. The UN is mm -hmm. not that big, but their scope of influence is, is huge. But it's a, uh, overall, uh, the money that goes to the UN is a very small amount. But how yes. would this federation exist, uh, be a counterpart to the UN, or would it replace the UN? Or how, how exactly would that work? Sure, sure, sure. Well, there, there are a number of questions embedded in what you just said. So let me right. uh, yeah, uh, no, all let, let me let me unpack them and, and, and take okay, them. Sure. So yes. so the, the way I like to think about it is right now, when you and I go to vote, we vote first at the local level for our mayors, our local officials. We vote at the state level for our governor. Uh, and members of the state legislature. We vote at the national level for our president and members of Congress. But imagine if we also voted on the global level for representatives to a world parliament. And at that level, the global level, there would be a world constitution, a bill of rights. There would be universal accountability. So no one would be above the law. There would be individual accountability so if a dictator commits genocide on their own people or goes and attacks another country, rather than now where we have state accountability, not individual accountability, you have to like when, um, we, you know, we worked with uh, Syria, you know, we, you embargo a country, uh, end up starving the children, you arm the rebels, whatever. But why not, if, if Assad is a bad actor, why not arrest them? and take them to court and they're either guilty or innocent. So you'd have individual accountability at the global level. You'd also have global structures that the UN doesn't have. You'd have a world parliament, a legislative branch. You'd have a world court system for violations of international law. You'd have a world executive branch. And those institutions would essentially protect the rights and security of the people of all nations and provide a peaceful means for resolving disputes. And all of that would be organized like many governments are by, by along the lines of what's, what's called the federal principle of subsidiarity. So local problems would still be handled at the local level, state problems at the state level, you know, national problems at the national level. But now instead of this, um, loose system of treaties and voluntary arrangements, you now have binding international law at the global level. So, um, so that would be the structure of it. Um, one, another way to think about it is um, if you were to take the EU, what the European Union is trying to do, move it a little bit further into the future till it becomes the United States of Europe and expand that worldwide. So you'd have a, rather than we have a federation in the United States, they're moving toward a federation of Europe, well, imagine a world federation. So you have now a global democracy 
with the tools at the global level that nations have at the national level, but the world doesn't have it right now. You mentioned subsidiarity, and that, of course, uh, leads, uh, I think, back to when the International Criminal Court was created, and that yes. was one of the arguments that was used for the International Criminal Court to assure the United States that its soldiers would not be hauled before the International Criminal Court or that type of thing, because we already had a judicial system that was in place. But it also leads right into the sovereignty. And of course, as we look at the UN today, it's 193 sovereign countries that yes. come together voluntarily at the United Nations to deal with these issues. How would that affect the sovereignty of these countries sure. that yeah, would yeah, be no, part no. of it? Yes, well, that, that, that certainly is one of the kind of hot button issues whenever you talk about global organization. So as, as world federalists view it, the problem isn't sovereignty. The problem is what some people call absolute sovereignty. So for example, um, if, you, if a nation has absolute sovereignty and it's you know, run by a dictator or whatever, that they, well, they're sovereign. They could commit genocide against their own people, they could attack another country. No one tells them what to do. They're a sovereign nation. They could, um, you know, release pollutants into a river and it goes downstream, poisons the water in the next country. Um, in the case of Brazil, you're a sovereign nation. You could destroy the rainforest, use it for lumber. And uh, it doesn't matter that the uh, world considers it the lungs of the earth. Um, so sovereignty um, is great when it's within your own country. But it would against to spill over and violate human rights and do all those kinds of things. Um, that's an issue. So what we, what world, the way world federalists view it, is that there is there are areas where there is in fact sovereignty, most areas, but there are also areas where there's shared sovereignty, just like in the United States. So around when it comes to issues of global concern and impact. Then there's what we would call shared sovereignty, just like the United States and the federal government that, you know, I live in California. We have disputes over the water rights, often in the Colorado River. You know, we, we, we have a border with Arizona. You don't see, um, you know, the uh, California uh, government uh, mobilizing uh, its National Guard. Uh, to go up to the uh, you know river and attack Arizona for the water, you know. Instead, we go to a higher authority. We go to the federal government. So this would be a way, or part of how it would function is it would be a way for countries that have disputes to go to that higher authority and to um, to sue, you know. Instead of um, you know taking your dispute to the battlefield. You take it to court and sue. And it works very much like, you know, it would work in the United States with its federal government. Well, it's a concept that's been around. It's a very interesting concept. And it's one that I think needs to be discussed because we need mm -hmm. to strengthen the institutions that are out there. Many of them work very well, but they're, you can always make an improvement, I guess. You know, there's no mm -hmm. perfect institution. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our shows, you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're talking about an international issue that's really a quite interesting concept, and that is how to make involvement of peoples all around the world more democratically involved in developing solutions and dealing with the problems we confront such as climate change, human trafficking, human rights violations, and issues such as that. My guest today is Dr. Bob Flax, who is a psychologist, organization development consultant, 
educator, and activist. He is the former executive director of Citizens for Global Solutions, and, it, and it's, he's also an advisor to the World Federalist Movement. Bob, we're talking about the, the world. This really, it's uh, it's not exactly a one world government, I guess. You can correct me on that in a moment, but it's still a much larger organization. And when I think of that, I'm thinking, uh, first, uh, first question everybody asks, how do you fund this? And of course, we look at the UN today. The UN is not a one world government. It has no ability to tax. It has to depend upon the donations and the, the fees, I guess you could say, of the 173 or 193 individual member states and that type of thing. How would your counter proposal be funded and how much are we talking about? What kind of a ballpark figure? Sure, sure. Well, let, let me first speak to the one world government, that kind of ominous label um, that's very often used, and then we'll get into the dollars and cents of it and how, how this would be funded. So usually when the, the phrase one world government is used, it usually describes what we would call a unitary government. So someone in Brussels, for example, I live in California, someone in Brussels would be dictating the kind of breakfast cereal that I could have. So, so that's not what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about, again, a democratic federal system. So local issues still get addressed at the local level, state issues at the state level, national issues at the national level. And what we call now international issues is what gets handled by the World Federation. Things like you mentioned, um, climate disasters, war, human trafficking, um, you know, things of that sort that are global issues, uh, economic calamities, pandemics. That's what this would deal with rather than dictating the behavior of an individual any place in the world. So I want to distinguish between a one world government and a democratic world government, two very different things. Okay, let's get to money. So there, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now speaking basically in the world of proposals, and there are a number of proposals for how this might be funded. One of the more common is a simple percentage of the GDP of the organizations on the earth. So whether it's 2% or, you know, fixed across the nations, or whether it's more of a progressive thing where the poor nations might give a half a percent of their GDP, the richer nations might give two or 3% or whatever. So that's a kind of standard proposal, a percent of GDP. But there are a number of, very, of other very interesting proposals that I've seen. One is there's a Nobel Prize winning economist uh, named James Tobin, who proposed something that became known as the Tobin tax, also called the financial transaction tax, that um, there are, I don't know whether there are hundreds of thousands or millions of transactions every day happening. You know, th many of them are computer generated. Uh, people don't even have a, you know, uh, involvement in, in, in that. It, they just go automatically. So what Tobin uh, proposed in, in another context is that there'd be just a slight tax on each of those transactions, perhaps a few pennies. And what was calculated is if you were to do that, you could generate over a trillion dollars per day by that. So that alone could fund a global organization. So, but that's only one proposal. Another one is there's been a proposal for people, I mean, for there being a, a tax on the use of the global commons. So countries or, um, or corporations, whatever, that use um, the seas, that use outer space, you know, the global commons, you pay a tax for that. That could raise money. And my favorite is going after corruption. Um, you might remember it was back, I think, in 2016, um, something called the Panama Papers came out. That, um, that there were, I think, about 10 million documents leaked from a Panamanian law firm. And they, they were about 200, I think 200,000 entities that were um, you know, handled by this law firm. Many of them were shell corporations that were set up for fraud, tax evasion, money laundering, 
and all that. And they estimated there was about eight, eight trillion with a T, eight trillion dollars um, hidden in that. So go, and that was only one, one place, you know, one, one law firm. So going after that sort of thing could also be a funding source. So there are many ways and many proposals out there um, for how something like this would be funded. In terms of the, the other side of your question, how much would it cost? That would depend on the scope and the powers that the world constitution would grant to the World Federation. So again, there are some proposals to make a World Federation what we call minimalist, that it would just be cre created to abolish war, which was the original intent. Um, and that would cost a certain amount. But if it's more maximalist, if that World Federation is not only trying to abolish war, but also handle the environment, pandemics, global poverty, that would cost more money. So really there's, you know, I'll call it a sliding scale, depending on the scope of powers um, that are granted to this by the world constitution. Well, it's certainly a very interesting concept. And again, it's one that has been debated. I remember back in the 80s, it was very popular. A lot of people were discussing it. Uh, you mentioned the Tobin tax. That was getting a lot of play and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then it just seemed to fall back into the shadows or something, at least in the stuff that I read. I, uh, maybe I'm <laughs> limited in my reading. But in the last uh, 30 seconds or so that we have, mm -hmm. what would you suggest that folks who are interested in this do as far as learning more about it and to really get involved, to be, uh, well, as an active participant in discussing it and moving the idea forward, because uh, all ideas are good until we come up with better ideas, I yeah. guess. Sure. Well, the, the first step of any change, and I could say this being a psychologist also, is awareness that most people have never heard of this idea. When I talk about it, people scratch their heads and go, my God, why haven't I heard of this? So awareness is the first part. And you said at the, be at the beginning of the broadcast, um, you know, how to become aware. If you wanna find out more about the United States National Organization, Citizens for Global Solutions, you can go to that website, globalsolutions.org. If you want to find out about the work of the international umbrella organization, the World Federalist Movement, that's WFM-IGP.org. And there are decades of, of good books and articles and things written on World Federation. So um, one could start at those websites, but you can also just Google the term and find out more that way. Well, in our last 10 seconds, do you yeah. see that there's more of an interest today than there was maybe 20, 25 years ago in discussing this topic? Sure. Well, interestingly enough, um, Gutierrez, the Secretary General uh, of the UN, is really talking now about major UN reform and what we sometimes call UN 2.0 and really moving the UN more in this direction. So, so there are, you know, people are realizing the solutions that we have tried to, you know, handle the pandemic, war, et cetera, just are not working. They're very limited. So people are now looking for what else can we do? So yes, there is growing interest in World Federation and other similar ideas. Well, Dr. Bob Flax would encourage everyone to learn as much as possible about this and other ideas as to what we can do differently to help us move forward in combating climate change and this whole litany of issues that are really threatening the planet to a large degree. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Right. Well, thank you, Bill. Good being with you. Thank you, Bob. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.